All Kerry Knoll has done over the years is develop three companies that turned into Thompson Creek Metals, Beta Gold, and Gold Corp. His latest project is Pine Point Mining, a big zinc play in the Northwest Territories. Here's our talk with Kerry Knoll. Kerry, we've talked before, but uh, there are probably some viewers who may not know the Pine Point mining story. It used to be Darnley Bay Resources. So update us on, on what you have there in the Northwest Territory. This is a past producing property where a Cominco, among others, was involved over the years. We have a large, very large zinc property in uh, the lower end of the Northwest Territories, just south of uh, Great Slave Lake. It's um, when I say large, it has 46 distinct deposits on the, on the property, lead zinc deposits. It was a past producer, as you mentioned, Cominco had it. Uh, Cominco is now part of the Tech uh, Corporation Group. Uh, they mined it from 1964 to 1987, so 23 years. They had a town there, they, had a, they built a railroad there, they built a hydroelectric dam on the river. It was a very, very large project in its day. Um, when uh, commodity prices were low in the 80s, they closed it down and it's remained closed ever since and we uh, intend to reopen it. So you hinted at it there, but a lot of the uh, infrastructure is still there, is that right? That's right. If, uh, if there was an infrastructure there, it wouldn't be nearly as attractive. It's got, uh, we have paved highway to the property, for example, a big benefit in the north. We've got railroads still going to the nearby town of Hay River. We have uh, hydroelectric power still going right across the site. We have um, two towns where we can draw employees from, local employees, which is, is good for them, but it's also good for us because we don't have to bring people in. You came out with your preliminary economic assessment, your PEA, a few months ago. Um, so within that, do you have as big a resource as you thought, and are the grades as strong as you thought, or, or was it kind of what you expected? The PEA was what we expected. What, uh, what, what's been happening since then, though, is we've been the PEA included only 10 of the 46 deposits that we had because those were deposits that were already in, in what's called 43101. So they were things that we could talk about to the market. We've got another 36 deposits that need some work on them, uh, what's called confirmation drilling. So they're old Cominco deposits that have been drilled off in the past, but they, since the f new regulations came in about 15 years ago, they haven't been touched. So we have to go in and confirm the drilling and then we're going to be adding a lot more of those deposits to the long-term mine plan. So this is going to get bigger without having to benefit from any discoveries. This is just from what we already have in hand, we're going to be able to make this project substantially bigger. Uh, Kerry, give us the next steps and the timeline into Q1 2020 for uh, commercial production. So our next steps uh, are several. One is to do that rest of that confirmation drilling. We did a lot of it this summer. We're going to do the rest of it over the winter. Uh, that's step one. Uh, another step is to do uh, some trade-off, engineering trade-off studies to figure out exactly how we and where we want to do everything. We're looking at expanding it substantially beyond the, the PEA, so that's going to take a bit of engineering work. Once that's done, we're going to start a feasibility study. Once the feasibility study is finished, we're, we intend to, subject to permitting, we intend to build the mine. And would you say that the team you have surrounded yourself with uh, makes your company stand out from others? I think so. We, uh, we focused on getting people who have direct experience in exactly what we're doing. So for example, our Chief Operating Officer, John Key, he ran the Polaris mine for Cominco back in the day. That was 60 kilometers from the magnetic North Pole, the lead zinc mine in the Northwest Territories. He also ran Red Dog for Tech in, uh, in, in Alaska near the Arctic Circle. Uh, Red Dog was, the, uh, was a sizable uh, zinc project when he went there, but by the time he left, it was the largest zinc mine in the world. And he ran that, and uh, um, he ran that successfully for several years. So he's, we, he's one of our people, but we have, we have a lot of former Tech Cominco people working in our organization, and uh, they, they have the experience both in the Arctic of building mines and of operating lead zinc operations. Broadly speaking, when you look at zinc, we keep hearing that it's the best position of the base metals and it's in tight supply going out several years. Is, is that what you're hearing uh, anecdotally too and based on the research you're doing? Absolutely. The zinc, the zinc market is interesting because, um, first of all, it's uh, unlike, say, copper, there's, there's not that many producers in the world, so it's fairly easy to track. The, the big thing about zinc happening right now is that it tends to go up between 2 and 4% a year in consumption. 
That increase represents one large mine every year. But worldwide, there's only a couple of new mines um, slated to go into production over the next three or four years. So not only is it in short supply right now, it's going to get shorter. Your stock did pretty well earlier in the year. It's trailed off a little bit lately. Is the market getting the story or, or are they missing it? I think they're missing it so far. I think that um, th th there are a number of Zinc Juniors uh, similar to us that have the, the share prices haven't moved yet. I think that the market may not quite grasp what's happening fundamentally in the Zinc market and how many years it's going to go out. Wood McKenzie thinks that it's going to be in a shortage uh, position at least until 2021 and, the, and the, the research that we've seen from them uh, doesn't go beyond 2021. So we've got at least uh, uh, four years going forward. Jeff Siachurski started Western Wind Energy from scratch and sold it a few years ago for $430 million, making shareholders a ton of money along the way. His latest company is Greenbrier Capital, which owns renewable energy projects in Canada and the United States. Here's our talk with Jeff. So Jeff, you sold Western Wind for a lot of money a few years ago uh, to Brookfield. You made investors right. a lot of money over the years. Now you've got Greenbrier, and uh, you think you've got a A1 all-star team. Why do you say that? Well, it's a, you need a gold medal team, Mark, to, to make things happen. And uh, we put together a group of guys that, that have been pioneers in the business. They go back 30 years in the industry when the industry really started. So if you go back, it was really a hobby. You know, you looked at popular mechanics, you saw a guy with a small house and a solar panel or a windmill. It was a hobby, and now it's obviously not... Uh, it's not alternative energy anymore, it's mainstream energy. So what we try to do is we try to differentiate, differentiate ourselves with the market by having, uh, going for high yield, high impact targets in the space. Now one of the deals you struck, or as part of that Brookfield deal, you got a, uh, an asset in Puerto Rico, you call this a high impact renewable contract. What does that mean? It basically, there's two things, there's two components to it. So a high impact contract originates uh, in an area that burns it makes really expensive electricity, so it burns oil. It puts it in boilers that are 50 years old. Uh, Hawaii, for example, the uh, c customers pay 43 cents a kilowatt hour U.S. You're probably paying 10 cents here in Ontario. So they're paying on, on a, a Canadian equivalent. They're paying 600% more for their power. Um, therefore, if you're doing a, a solar project in Hawaii, uh, you're going to get 20 cents a kilowatt hour as a developer and, uh, and owner operator. If you did that in Arizona, you're going to get paid 3 cents a kilowatt hour. So there's a 700% premium by being in Hawaii. At the same time, you're not worried about political backlash because you're still selling power at less than half the price what consumers are paying. So th that's what would be called a high impact uh, market. Now what it does for the shareholders is instead of diluting shares, having to sell shares to pay for the equity piece, all projects require equity, they require debt. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you don't have to sell any corporate equity. So it avoids dilution. You're doing everything at the project level, including getting an equity loan able to finance a complete project, you make enough cash, it flows up to the shareholders, and you deliver for the shareholders what you're supposed to be doing as a public company president. Right. Now, uh, we know that Puerto Rico was basically devastated by a recent hurricane, but in a perverse way, in the way business works and governments work, it actually has worked out pretty well for, for Greenbrier. So what's the best case uh, in Puerto Rico for you, and, and what's the worst case? Yeah, so you, you definitely don't want a hurricane to make your business model uh, work. We, we truly wanted the federal government to take over Puerto Rico seven or eight years ago. Um, what Hurricane Maria has done is that, the, the, in fact, the federal government is in control of Puerto Rico. It's taken over the utility. So we had a credit rating in Puerto Rico probably double D. Now the credit rating is triple A. So our counterparty in our $2 billion contract is the U.S. federal government and not uh, the local utility. Um, how that translates to, to kind of like value, um, you know, I've been in Puerto Rico since 2008. And uh, in 2013, Puerto Rico started having credit issues. Uh, 2015, uh, we worked with the utility. We got to a point where we needed to litigate to protect our position. Uh, we've won every battle in court since that time, and the judge ordered a damage report. We've got a $191 million uh, uh, damage valuation issued on the court on our behalf. $191 million is great. We only have 16 million shares outstanding. We prefer to build the project. So the project would bring us $58 million a year in revenue for 35 years, uh, at the same time creating 1,100 jobs, uh, putting $360 million into the economy, and uh, $12 million a year of taxes. So we, we prefer to build the project than to, than to collect the award. 
Let's uh, shift gears and go overseas to this uh, Gauzy acquisition sure. that you made. You're excited about this smart glass, and you and you say it's similar to what the the state of uh, solar in say 2002 or so. So, what is smart glass? Why it's important? Why is it important for your company? So when you're in the renewable energy business like we have for the last 15 years, you learn that what's better than renewable energy is energy efficiency, energy conservation. So on our background, our research, we found a company in Israel who makes an innovative smart glass product, which basically, uh, in a flick of a second, it, uh, it turns the, any kind of glass uh, medium in from opaque to transparent, anywhere in between, within a tenth of a second. It's got a huge impact for the environment on energy. And what's your strategy with smart glass? A strategy is basically uh, on a very high level uh, pattern is to work with, we're, we are working with big sales organizations, companies that have uh, 10,000, 15,000 salespeople who market a certain set of co consumer products and we've introduced our product into their, into their, basically their product line, have them do the sales. So really it's a classical distribution model. There's no capital expenditures required from us. We simply get the product from Israel. We sell it anywhere in the world on an exclusive basis. Um, if, you, if you, you know, your reference back to energy, 16% of all energy in the United States is consumed through the window. So it's basically air conditioning systems that are removing the heat that's coming in from the thermal energy. So what you get is you get a smart ga glass solution, reduces the energy load in a building, and at the same time, you don't have to buy drapes or shutters or blinds. You can adjust the windows just like you would if you had uh, physical drape shutters and blinds. You do it electronically. It's, it's where solar and wind was in 2002. It's got a great gro growth pattern uh, that we were, we're excited about. And lastly, Jeff, uh, viewers are wondering, uh, this is all very interesting, but are you making money? When are you going to make money? And right. what do the financials look like? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple segments. So on the, on the renewable segment, with the feds now taking over uh, Puerto Rico, we don't need to raise capital to pay for the project. So once the official uh, handover takes place, which we expect within the next 60 days, where you have the federal government running the utility, we expect to finance, with a AAA credit rating, we will we'll finance that completely at the project level. So we expect that to add a couple hundred million dollars to our market cap. On the Gauzy situation, we're doing things on a top level approach. So we just had the deal approved like three, four weeks ago. Uh, that project will now the, will move out to these different sales forces. So we're kind of anticipating two years, about 30 million in sales from Gauzy and about 58 million a year from the solar project in two years as well. And you want to say one more thing to wrap it all up with a bow? I think you're buying management. I think you're buying guys that have been in the business uh, right from the beginning. You're buying a company that has the, big, the top players in the field. There's probably 10,000 people that are involved in renewable energy. There's only 12 teams that can build projects from scratch and do it without any form of dilution. And uh, we've got a great company, great team, and 16 million shares out. So we're looking after the shareholder more than anybody else. A lot of companies say they use artificial intelligence because it's a hot buzzword right now. But VIQ Solutions walks the walk. They are increasingly using artificial intelligence, or AI, in their flagship platform. We spoke to the CEO, Sebastian Paré. Sebastian, VIQ Solutions, explain the business model, what do you do, and how are you different from other companies? Uh, this is a very good question. So we came from a decade of providing digital recording technology uh, for the justice market worldwide. Uh, we're truly an international company. And uh, really, if you've been involved in that kind of market in the past, you'll appreciate that security and is absolutely critical to what we do. So cybersecurity has always been keen to what we do. So what we ended up doing is taking that background, that pedigree and that track record uh, in security in the justice market, and we've been slowly but surely penetrating many other markets. So here we are today. Uh, into a diversified marketplace where the same technology, the platform that we use to collect audio and video and sources from all kinds of channels. So we went from collecting data on the audio in a courtroom using microphones to now we're collecting data from uh, Internet of Things. So it could be drone, it could be uh, cameras mounted in vehicles, it could be sensors, motion detection. So really what we do is the platform has evolved to a point where now it's creating an evidence, basically a movie behind the scene from all kinds of sources. And that movie, that digital content is now being used for all kinds of purposes. So it could be in a courts, uh, it could be in the context of physicians monitoring other surgeons. Uh, it could be about surgeons going through competency assessment. 
Uh, it could be interviews for immigration, interview for drugs administration. It could be all kinds of different settings, but the concept is the same from one market to another. We're basically collecting evidence and media content from an all limited number of channels, and we bring it all together into a secure way, and then we transport that data from the point of source all the way to a central repository. And then from there, we allow our customers to actually maximize the use of that content for all kinds of operational purposes. So mining the data is a big component of what we do today. Sebastian, in the last couple of quarters, you've had solid revenue growth, your EBITDA positive, cash flow positive. Uh, where is that coming from? So we also have no debt. So, uh, so the balance sheet is very clean. It came from an acknowledgement early on that we knew the platform was really solid and it was a matter of investing in the right innovation. So we've been securing patents. Uh, we've been able to come up with all our mobility product lines. We came up with collaboration products. Uh, we came up with a military grade edition version of the platform that we're now using with some of the uh, agencies in the US. And all of that came from innovation and a desire to expedite and accelerate the growth. So a lot of that growth uh, took place was based on those innovations and then the adoption of those new product lines into our customer base. And it really came from existing customers adopting new things, but also brand new customers onboarding into the platform. Uh, we've also uh, shifted all our reporting towards recurring revenue because it's a big component of what we do now. And it also reflects the reality of where we are today and where we're going next. Uh, we've also switched to uh, all US reporting for obvious reasons that internationally, all our customers are actually transacting in US currency. So we've done all of that in the last two quarters. But yeah, we've been up to a very solid start this year, uh, posting back to back two or three quarters in a row of 40% growth. And that has been outstanding. So now the word is starting to come out uh, in terms of where does that come from, where you're going. And I think it's very clear that uh, part of where we're going next is to continue to work with our existing clients on pushing the envelope. Because one of the things VIQ does is we can basically generate that content, secure that content, store that content with our client, and that content is, is a gold mine in terms of analytics and really leveraging that. So if you look at some of our press releases lately, you'll see that uh, you know, the trend is moving towards mining that data into new ways to allow our customers to finally unlock the power of the content that they're generating today. The stock market can be a chaotic place. Do you want to stand out from the crowd? Watch Capital Ideas TV. Never be the last to know. Organic Garage's new store is under construction in Liberty Village in Toronto, which is one of the most densely populated areas in North America. We had a chance to visit the site and talk to the founder and CEO, Matt Lurie. So Matt, we're in the Liberty Village location, 13,000 square feet. This is a very cool, funky, up and coming area. So what were some of the demographic reasons, some of the, the major factors that, that drew you to Liberty Village? Yeah, we, we like this area for a number of reasons. Number one, the population density in the Liberty Village area is very high. Uh, a lot of condo dwellers, a lot of people within a half a kilometer, one kilometer radius, which is much different than a suburban store where you're looking at one, three and five kilometers out. Uh, also a very high average uh, household income. Um, a large propensity are university educated professionals um, and also a younger millennial style of consumer. So it was a great demographic for us. Definitely some key targets that we always look for. Just looking at the location, uh, you're essentially street level. You're going to get a lot of foot traffic. What else is around here that uh, is intriguing and maybe compelling for the, the customer? Uh, I think a couple things. Number one, there is a Green Pea parking very close by. So in terms of accessibility, people can come, come and park safely. It's probably no more than 50 feet away. So that's very attractive. Uh, also, in terms of um, you know, a large national grocer, um, it's one of their top spots in Ontario. So we know that there's um, a, a large volume of customers in terms of purchasing natural and organics in the area based off of their kind of um, uh, you know, historical sales that made the location that much more attractive. So we've talked before that the junction design location is going to be the template going forward, but this is a different kind of building. So what are some of the design features here in Liberty Village in this building that will be unique? 
Well, some of the things we loved about this building is it's, it's a hundred year old building. So it has a lot of character existing that we don't have to recreate. It also has a lot of existing brick and uh, wood beams. It has a lower ceiling, so it'll create a more intimate feel. Um, so those are some of the things that will make it uh, you know, unique and different. And also when we look at our locations, we look at them like siblings. They all share the same bloodline, but they're all inherently a little bit different. So while this location will follow some of the design trends that we did in Junction, it will have its own kind of inherent feel, um, just like a, a, a family member would to somebody else, so yeah. So Matt, you uh, recently announced, an Organic a Garage announced uh, a new program called the Handpicked Partner. Uh, and you're hoping to drive down costs, drive revenue. Explain it for us. Why did you start this? Well, when we started looking at adding uh, ex you know, additional services into our store, we wanted to do it in a smart way that didn't add you know, costs to our bottom line, and specifically labor. And a lot of the things that we don't specifically focus on, like prepared foods, um, are labor-intensive applications. So we set out to create this um, um, hand-picked partner program where we could introduce different services that are not necessarily our forte, whether that be, for example, like a sustainable sushi um, kind of concept or a juice bar or a cafe or even a restaurant. These are all labor-intensive applications. Um, and we're not in that business. We're in the grocery business. But we want to bring people in that kind of jive with kind of all our culture and our listing criteria and our ingredient decks and give these services or these, these um, hand-picked partners an opportunity to sell their products to our customer base. And in terms of from a, you know, a shareholder existing and a new shareholder perspective, it should be very attractive to them because not only does it drive more traffic into the stores, thus increasing the store sales, but it also drops our occupancy costs because these hand-picked partners either pay a, a combination of rent or percentage rent or it's a revenue share. So it adds a bottom line profit um, you know, very easily. Anything else you want to touch on we didn't talk about? Yeah, I just think it's, it, you know, the, this Liberty Village store, um, it's in the heart of the city. It's a very uh, heavily populated area. There's lots of amenities nearby from different restaurants and things like that are driving traffic to the area. So from a, you know, a walk by in terms of, um, you know, accessibility and things like that, um, we're excited because we think it's going to be one of our top locations um, as we expand, you know, as part of our 416 strategy and, you know, growing the Toronto market. So I think it should be very exciting, um, you know, once it's, once it opens. The price of cobalt has soared this year in part because it's needed in lithium ion batteries to feed the surging electric vehicle market. U.S. Cobalt has a mine in Idaho and it wants to capitalize on this multi-year megatrend. We talked to the CEO, Wayne Tisdale. Wayne Cobalt has had a really hot year, I don't need to tell you that. I understand that uh, you think and many think that, that there's almost a, a perfect storm going on right now in terms of the supply and demand situation. Uh, explain that for us. Well, it's quite simple. The uh, governments around the world have um, suggested that we should not have any more cars running on the road with, uh, uh, and so they've you know, introduced electric cars. And with electric cars, it takes batteries and it takes inside the battery, you have cobalt. And each one of those co cars have anywhere from five kilograms to eight kilograms of cobalt in that car to run it to keep the charge going. Can you give us some some numbers in terms of the demand we're seeing? Uh, you hinted at the fact that governments are mandating yes. that you have to have electric vehicles on the road by X amount of time, and so many companies are pushing in that direction. So uh, give us give us a sense of the numbers and uh, where the price may go with uh, with cobalt. Well, the numbers are, are very, <clears throat> very large. If you, look, if you read the FT yesterday on Volkswagen, they went out for a year's supply, which is 100,000 tons of cobalt for their new uh, generation of car, and they couldn't buy it. Uh, the market uh, just didn't have it. It is, just isn't in the market. And uh, in, your cobalt comes from mostly the DRC. Uh, there's a few mines around the world. And of course, the, the problem we've had, we have a lot of major mines shut down around the world, like the Philippines shut all their uh, nickel laterite mines down because uh, of the pollution. And that took a lot of cobalt because it was a byproduct. And copper's been down a lot, and there's not big mines going in carrying the cobalt. So pure cobalt plays are hard to come by. So you're in Idaho with the Iron Creek mine, the Iron which Creek has mine. been around, around for a long time. Yeah. So what, what makes this different? What makes it special? Well, it makes it special because it was a uh, project that was worked in the 40s. 
Uh, they looked for iron, and then in the 70s and 80s, Cominco and Naranda went in, basically looking for copper, and came across a large uh, a component of cobalt. And uh, this particular ground is patented, so it's private ground. I was sitting, and a, a gentleman phoned me up and said, listen, I've got this project in uh, Idaho, and I jumped all over it. I, I was looking at lithium at the time, and I thought, wow, cobalt. So I did a little bit of research and got involved in that. and. We went down and tied down property, and it's a patented ground. So we're not up against the permits that most people are in Idaho uh, dealing with the forestry. So we're way advanced in that thing. Right, and you, and you mentioned that Naranda and Kamenko have been there before. They've done a lot of work. A lot. So where do you stand now in terms of your exploration plans? And maybe you can give us a, a timeline uh, as to uh, uh, what the next steps are. Well, we, we went in and we opened up the, uh, the uh, existing um, ground. It had three uh, tunnels on it, or adits, and what we did is we went in to reconfirm the historical value that they had left in their data, which suggested that we had 1.2 million tons of about 0 0.5, 0 0.55 cobalt. And so we then spent this season uh, permitting ourselves, opening up our tunnels, getting all the, all the uh, qualifications in place, and we are now starting to confirm uh, that they were they knew what they were doing and the and the results were there, so we've just uh, we did chip sampling. We announced about three weeks ago. Uh, we've released 13 holes that confirms their work is in place, and we've now opened up all the all the tunnels, and uh, we can now carry on our exploration program not only during the surface drills, but we can go underground and start drilling and expanding on that uh, process. So Wayne, what, what is a blue sky scenario for U.S. cobalt and what are some of the, the challenges and risks? Well, the challenge and risk is always in exploration. You know, that, that's, that's the biggest risk. That's why we're always in mining. Um, uh, the blue sky is that we're open on, on all ends of the, on the project and um, I think having this underground uh, drilling program for the winter will expand us uh, to a greater degree. I mean, I don't want to put tons to it because it seems to be, but we're looking to go for in that range of about four to five million tons. That's that's the goal that we're working with now. And so, bottom line, uh, you want you want to be part of this uh, parallel universe of uh, demand for electric vehicles and lithium-ion batteries. Yes. Well, I mean, th this is a crazy story. I mean, I don't know where cobalt will go. It could go to two hundred dollars a pound. It really doesn't matter. People get all saying it's thirty-five or forty or fifty. What's going to happen? Because the government's implemented all these laws that you're going to have to have an electric car. They'll just pass that on to the consumer. So if Volkswagen can't get it and they have to pay $100 a pound for the thing, they will then add that to the battery charge and add that to the cost of the car and push it out. That's the, that's the, big, the big play. There is no big mines coming on at the moment. There's a little bit of work in the DRC, which everybody knows that that's just a little bit of a, um, a crazy place to work. And it's also not very healthy for the child labor part of the, our thing. Our cell phone carries 10 grams of, of uh, cobalt from some child labor that's been working hard in the DRC. And it seems that people are now becoming aware of it. And so we're looking for a source, which we found in North America, that, uh, that is permitted in our exploration plan. We don't have a big job getting from where we are today to where we could get into a production situation. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.